One of our mottos about our communal witness together is that we're a learning and missional community. That's what Los Ranchos is. That's what we always strive to be. And tonight is a night where we're going to be talking and listening to each other around table. We will be just in a few minutes um, dividing up and joining other members of other churches and sitting with them and going through a process of mutual invitation around some questions that the strategic coordinating team has worked hard at to, uh, to bring to you tonight. And so one of the things I wanted you to know that in times of high stress, you've already heard our moderator, Lydia, mention that, that this is kind of a challenging time for our culture, for denominations responding to our culture. In those times, often it's difficult to have sensible, even keeled conversations. And we found that in our SCT when we first got together. I mean, your SCT is basically nominated by a nominating committee of this presbytery. And we have very different opinions on a lot of matters. But we have very much the same sort of devotion to Jesus Christ. And we come together in Christ. And so it took us a while. We worked on a number of books and read through books, Difficult Conversations by the Harvard Negotiation Project. And you'll see on the third page of your green handout tonight, a list of resources that has been created for you. And you'll actually see the communication work that we did. You can go online to our website tomorrow and you can actually see this presentation online in a much fuller way than you see it tonight. But we've also been in a journey together with a man named Peter Steinke and he wrote this book, Congregational Leadership in Anxious Times and also a door set open, which, by the way, we still have a few copies over against that wall if you'd like to purchase one tonight. But we've been working hard at learning how communications go smoothly and how they go sideways. And so why is it difficult to understand each other? And basically the reason is that we come from such different places in life. We see the world so differently from one another. First of all, we have observations. I'm reminded of a little boy, he's five years old, he's invited by his father to go to the homecoming parade at the local high school. And there he is with a son, and the son is all excited, and they go home, and the wife is uh, waiting at home for them. And how was it? How was the parade? And, and the son said, oh, it was the best truck parade I've ever seen. And the father said, truck parade? What do you mean? You know, it was a parade of floats. But all the boy saw at that parade was the trucks that were pulling these floats. And so we have different observations even in the same events. We filter information differently. And then we give different meanings. We interpret events differently from one another. For example, someone who you take out to lunch might feel like you're being quite extravagant going out to a restaurant. I know that was the case when I first started dating my wife, Jan. We went out to a restaurant, and she thought it was so extravagant. And I began to wonder why about this. And it's because her family didn't go out to restaurants very often. And so we give different meanings to our observations based on our past experiences. And so those of us we know who maybe were alive during the Great Depression, we think about money very differently, for example, than those of us who grew up maybe in the 80s and 90s. So we interpret things differently. And then we draw different conclusions on the, the information that we gathered. Now, this is a little harsh, it sounds a little harsh, based on our self-interest. And there's a man named Howard Wraith from Harvard Business School who brought together teams of students from his business school and he said, okay, the teams over here, we want you to evaluate the, the price of this company. And you're gonna be the team that's gonna be selling this company. And so this team went off, and he said, you need to be as objective as possible. And then he took another set of students, another set of teams from the business school and said, okay, you're going to be the team that is going to be buying this company. And so he set them apart, and he told them, be as objective as possible. These are not, you know, your slowest people in the world. And trust me about that. And then he had an, an independent assessor evaluate the value of this company. And so those two sets of teams came back, the sellers and the buyers, 
And the sellers had a price that were, was 30% higher than the assessed value, the fair market value of the company, as assessed independently. And guess what the buyers had? 30% lower. So we come to different conclusions based upon our observations and our interpretations and how we draw all those together. So it's a miracle that we ever understand each other at all. And um, my wife, I think, is still struggling to understand me at times, which is okay. That's what it means to be in a covenant of marriage, and I'm, we're working that out. So it's a miracle that we understand each other. Now, those of us who have been exposed to Peter Steinke and read his books, and I know there's a number of pastors who are almost devotees of Steinke's work, and we also had him at our pastor's retreat last February. He talks about the lizard brain. And basically, the lizard brain is ever, whenever we're anxious about something, we think with something called the amygdala, the part of the brain that's called the amygdala. And it's basically the part of the brain that kicks in when we're in fight or flight about something. And it's, it causes us uh, to not think very well because it's the left prefrontal cortex that actually does your thinking. And so in times of high anxiety, we think with this lizard brain. Well, what causes us to move into that modality? Well, disruptions, hostile forces, uh, feeling trapped. I mean, there have been some big historic decisions in the last few years in our church. Think of 10A. Think of a whole new form of government. These are One of those would be historic. But we're trying to adapt to two of these and how it ripples out with our communal life together. So we just don't think straight when we get into that fight or flight mode. So one of the challenges we have is to learn to self-regulate, which means I need to take a deep breath. I need to figure out where I am. Is my blood boiling right now? In fact, I was with a group of pastors. We were with this consultant. We were, it was during the, not this election, but the last election, and we were arguing about the concentration of wealth in America and just how concentrated it's becoming. And then, and then someone else on the other side was saying, oh, no, 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 you know, we got to protect that and, and those sorts of inheritance laws. And our consultant had stepped out just for a minute, just for a minute. He, he just stepped outside, and he came back in, and, I mean, there, there, it was like a bomb had gone off with this group of pastors. And he goes, wow, there's a lot of fire here, but not a whole lot of learning. You know, there's a lot of message giving. And so we, you know, when it comes to actually being a community together and learning from one another, we need to kind of ratchet down a little bit and learn to say, okay, I'm, my blood's boiling. Usually it has to do with how I'm feeling about me or, or some threat to me. Am, am I a good disciple? If, if our larger church decided to go in a certain direction, would we be a good disciple? Or would I be a bad disciple? It gets to our identity. It becomes that part of our conversation. So the fight or flight mode doesn't help godly communication. And that's all the more reason we need to call on the Holy Spirit to give us peace and a sound mind. So good questions to ask yourself when you're faced with difficult conversations. Are you coming from a place of fear or trust? I mean, we had to ask that. In fact, we put out all of our fears as an SCT. We spent hours and hours listing our fears. And if anyone wants to see those, I have them all. So we did that. But in this conversation, am I feeling fearful right now or trust, trusting? Is learning be, being achieved? Or are we merely trying to justify your position? And thankfully, mutual invitation gives us the opportunity actually to just listen. And John McCaig is going to be leading us through that tonight and show us how that works. Also, be aware of how you frame conversations. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I brought this painting from my office, and I think it's a beautiful painting. Someone else complimented me on it. I did not paint it. But the way we frame information and frame conversations really is important to what we understand. And some people can step back and look at the whole painting and think, wow, what a beautiful. But some, and, and believe me, it's natural, it's unavoidable to frame things the way we'd like to frame them. It's just unavoidable. But let's say that this is all you got. It's unavoidable for us to frame things the way we like to frame them. And that's all you're going to see. 
So as a community that is trying to learn and be missional together, maybe we need to see a different part of the painting or a different part of the picture. So be aware of your own frames. How am I framing this up for these other folks around the table with me? Um, how are they framing it up? Because I'm telling you one thing about Presbyterians, they're very, very clever. <laughs> clever people. I've been in a lot of Presbyterian churches throughout my life, and I know that. And so uh, be careful with how you frame information. And I want to say that one thing great about being called on a team like the SCT is that we call each other on it. No, 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 don't go there. That's kind of limiting the discussion. <laughs> you know, hold on here. Let's step back. And so the materials that we have in this resource guide for you tonight on the third page of the green packet you have, those materials are really materials that help you kind of step back and, and take a look at the whole and learn skills so that you can grow and learn together. And one last word I want to say is that, you know, you'll find out if your lizard brain is kicking in. Uh, your blood pressure will go up, you'll feel a little heated, you'll start to know, you'll, you'll learn how to regulate yourself as you try to seek the mind of Christ together. But one thing that would be tremendously helpful, and this comes from our former moderator of our denomination. In fact, I, th I think she just went to be with the Lord recently, Cynthia Bullback. But I was, I was stunned by this in her message this last July. If we all stopped categorizing each other with easy labels, we'd be much better equipped as disciples to help people see Jesus. She was preaching on the text from Mark that is in today's lectionary. Of all things, I had no idea it was going to drop on today's uh, lectionary. But it's the gospel reading for today. It just happened to be where these four people come and they, they bring a man who's paralyzed and they dig through a roof so that they can help this paralyzed man see Jesus. And that's all they care about. It doesn't say that those four are the man's friend in that text in Mark. You go read it but they, they help people see Jesus. And she says it would help us a lot more as disciples if we'd, uh, if we'd do away with the easy labels. And I thought that was a good word. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, Paul says, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Thank you.